you know what? It's absolutely criminal that I haven't featured an American watch on this channel yet. And what happened to the American watch industry is also criminal. So come on in and let's investigate what happened as I restore this Waltham wristwatch from the 1960s. Greetings my fellow dreamers and a very warm welcome to you all. So my desire to feature an American watch on this channel started three months ago when I was filming a Waltham pocket watch. But I had a few missing parts which I was unable to source and so sadly the project is still waiting to be finished. And at first I was very reluctant to use today's watch as my first American watch on this channel as it's not an American Waltham at all. But then I thought this watch is perfect to describe the sad tale of the once flourishing American watch industry. This is a Waltham wristwatch from the 1960s with a 17 joule automatic movement made by Seiko. Now some of you may be rolling your eyes and scratching your heads right now. But as a hopeless sentimentalist, to me this sounds like an intriguing and beautiful relationship. Especially if you think what happened between America and Japan only a couple of decades prior to the birth of this watch. Now as a watchmaker who loves the history and stories of watch companies, I always find the history of the American watch industry a little bit sad and heartbreaking. The Japanese quartz revolution in the 1970s made timekeeping affordable to the masses. But the American watch industry had this desire to make timekeeping affordable for its people way back in the 1800s by the likes of companies such as Elgin and Waltham. That's handsome. <laughs> now you do have to push the setting lever to get the stem back in, like so. The American watch game was so strong, it impressed the Swiss to a point where Swiss companies started making fakes to imitate American watches known as the Swiss fakes. Feels a bit groggy. There's no hacking feature on it. Not only were the Swiss impressed, they were perplexed by the manufacturing techniques of the American watch companies, but it seems like a few rash and reckless decisions made by the American government started a steady decline in this once great timekeeping industry. Now I thought that was a scratch on the dial, but it's not, it's just a piece of fluff. And there's a bit of red Is it from there, no? Now the American watch companies weren't too fussed about selling their watches overseas. They were happy selling watches to their own people. The Swiss however wanted to break into the American market and for some reason the American government gave very favourable tax reliefs to the Swiss companies to import in their products. And then we had the two almost back-to-back -back world wars and the American government ordered companies such as Elgin to stop producing watches and help with the war effort by producing military equipment. The Swiss, however, were neutral in the war, so they extended their stranglehold on the American market further. So this thing, you can't actually manually wind it. The only way to wind it is via the automatic rotor. So I'm assuming there is some power in there. Just manually let the power down. Let's get this balance wheel out of the way first, lest we bugger it up. really do hope this one, this one is going to be straightforward. I'm usually up for a good fight, but I started filming three watches this week. I've hit a brick wall with each one. I'll put a little clip of one of them to show you what I mean. Man, look at the state of this. I don't know why I'm even filming this. I don't think I'm going to complete this one. Look at that. Seiko is still using the self-winding mechanism with just one gear. On the Swiss automatic mechanism you'll see multiple gears. And here is a modern version and they're still using that similar system there. Which is Q. Another similar one here which was licensed to companies like Rotary. In 1854, a man named Aaron Dennison started the Waltham Watch Company, 
based in Waltham, Massachusetts, which itself was a hub during the Industrial Revolution. And isn't it wonderfully strange that Aaron Dennison would later move to a few doors away from where I live in my home city, Birmingham. Y'all come back now, you hear? No, not that Birmingham, silly. The original Birmingham in the UK. Well, you may have given us Aaron Dennison, but we gave you Ozzy Osbourne. Sharon, this bloody bat tastes salty. Nice and simple. No frills. Well, that was on that second wheel. So we must remember to put that back on. Just looks like a little washer. So the genius of people like Denison and other companies based in Waltham had developed some of the most advanced tooling and machines, which took the American watch game to a level where they could mass produce 100% American made watches. The Americans had huge amounts of knowledge in mass production from the firearms industry and then later from Henry Ford, which was applied to the watch industry. The Swiss industry had nothing of the sort at that time as they were still producing handmade items in small quantities. And even back then, companies such as Elgin were flag bearers for the right to repair and were strong advocates for the need for wearers of their watches to be able to easily repair them with easy access and availability to exchangeable spare parts. Yeah, rust. It's minor. Now, after the Second World War, some of these great American watch companies were not able to regain the lost ground to the Swiss industry and slowly started to fade into the wilderness. The Waltham Watch Company was bankrupt in 1949 and totally defunct in 1957. So who licensed this once great name in watchmaking to produce this piece in front of us in the 60s? Was this another Swiss fake trying to capitalize on a great name? Please let me know in the comments if you guys have some knowledge on this subject. <laughs> These dial face screws look insane. But look how much material they saved here and here and here. <laughs> Every little bit helps. Companies as old as Rotary and Bulova did the same to stay in the game. There are so many companies who have adopted this type of collaboration to play and stay in the watch game. All your high street fashion brand watches such as Armani, Kors, Hugo Boss all license their names out and are produced with Japanese movements with everything else made in China. Some water and grass has occurred at some point. It's no biggie. My previous work on American pocket watches has shown me how Seiko and companies such as Waltham and Elgin shared a similar ethos. The desire to make things affordable, repairable, interchangeable for your average Joe. I noticed similarities in simplicity of design, function sharing parts, no unnecessary complications. I noticed the lack of posts and other elements in the designs to avoid or to eliminate the need to replace major parts such as the main plate or even the whole movement. If for example there was some accidental water ingress, it's cheaper to replace a rusty screw acting as a post rather than a whole main plate. So you see it's in the anti-clockwise rather than clockwise like most Swiss mainsprings. So, there's all the parts. Ooh, the lighting looks a bit shoddy. Oh, and look over there. There's another one of those projects that's waiting for a part. Should be here soon. Ooh, and what's this? I'm just gonna give some of these rusty parts a little bit of a clean. Some of you tune in just to see my equipment. Yeah, yeah, you guys in the back.
So there are three videos here. Hopefully you might be seeing all of them or you might not. So I've shown you guys how to do the plexi using the poly watch. I've also shown you how to do it with the Dremel. And one of my patrons saw me using the mop with some rouge and asked whether he can use anything else other than rouge. So I used the gray one for first cut and I used this one for the final polish on stainless steel. So I was wondering whether the crystal can be polished up using this and a fine mop. So let's give that a try. First things first, clean up the mop to make sure there's no bits of metals or anything stuck in there. We've got the hoover on there as well. So we're going to be very light with this because if you keep it on there for too long, you're going to melt it with the heat. Already you can see it's coming up. So let's have a quick look so you can see that didn't take too long just a little one left there and we'll see how that looks after a wash this one doesn't need much divvying to it so i'll just give it a light buff Stainless steel back. And there's the case, chrome case. We haven't done anything to it much. So we'll just give that a wash and see what it looks like. And if it's half decent, then we'll leave that as it is as well. There's the back. So I've kept the previous circular grain and I've just polished it up. And there's the case. The case has got scratches and imperfections, but it's chrome, so we leave that as it is, not faff around with it too much, because it's still very respectable. There's the plexi for the Waltham, it's come out really nice as well. So usually these red ones are the right-handed ones, the Swiss movements, and these ones are the sort of left-handed ones, or the Japanese ones. So you can see it's clockwise inside the tool. So when I flip it over into the barrel, it'll be anti-clockwise, which is completely different to the Swiss ones I usually show you guys. So now it's anti clockwise in the barrel. Usually we just bung in the mainspring first, but on this one we'll have to put that center wheel in first and then skating wheel in. And then we can just dump on that bridge. No, I don't have an oil chart up for this. But this center wheel is going to be doing a bit of grinding around this area here. So we'll give it some help and we can get this third wheel in. We can get the main spring in now. So much staining everywhere on these wheels.
don't forget this plastic or washer this could go on the actual movement no it's not for you this movement is known as the UT33 from the Universal Time Corp, a company set up by Seiko to sell bare off-the-shelf movements in bulk to anyone who wanted to buy them. And this movement is basically a Seiko 6601B. There isn't much information about the Universal Time Corporation, but it may have been set up to enter the American market. And the name Universal Time Corporation may have sounded a lot more friendly in those days than Seiko. I mean, there isn't a click, the spring does the whole job, I think. So as you can see, this is a very basic movement without any adornment whatsoever, with dual functioning parts such as the click spring also acting as the click. So you can see how the tip of the spring acts as the click. It's a lot of staining on this movement. This make it shine like a diamond in a goat's ass. Am I allowed to say ass? Kids, if you're listening, Ass means donkey. Right. Just as American companies were ordered by their government to help with the war effort, Seiko was also ordered by the Japanese government to help with their war effort by producing military gear. But after the war in the 1950s, Seiko started selling its products in the States. Waltham, however, did move some of its operations to Switzerland via a subsidiary company in the 1950s. So this watch probably can claim to be represented by three cultures, America, Asia, and Europe. Now that's pretty awesome considering all the beef nations had with each other back then. So as you can see there isn't a, a winding pinion. You can't actually wind it manually. So it's just a sliding pinion. D5 on that sliding pinion. And this just freestanding. There's no posts or anything. Oil on the post here. Ooh, we have a post. I think I'll apply a little bit of grease here because since that yoke doesn't have a post, I won't be able to rock it. So another example of a dual functioning part, the setting lever detent acting as a post, easily and cost effectively replaced. And this little cover here goes on the setting lever post. We're sharing posts because there's not enough to go around. Now we can get a beautiful stem in. And you do need to push the setting lever to get the stem in, like so. And that's all it does. Put it in time setting mode and nothing else. Let that little pallet fork in. And then test it before you fully tighten this screw. And you can give it a little wind manually here. So you can see this shock setting is a bit like the Nova Dia setting developed by Inkablock. Let me see if I can film this without buggering it up. I think I need to put this in a vice because I can't film that close. Give me a bit more length. And I think we got it.
Actually, these Seiko versions are quite easy. You can do them with just your tweezers rather than the fancy tools I've got. You can see that pivot is slightly off center, which adds to the magic. So this is Seiko's magic lever system, which does away with multiple wheels and reversing gears. It widens the mainspring regardless of which way the rotor spins. I'll let you guys pause this and have a read. So that little pivot is going to go inside that jewel there. So we'll put a little bit of lubrication in there. Time to say goodbye to our beautiful crown. Or maybe I should just leave it in. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Let's dare me to leave it in. So, since this case has a bit of a tube on it, you can put a little waterproof crown. So, I've got this one which is also chrome and you can see it's got a little gasket in there and that one fits 
quite snug so I'll use that one let's find the strap That one's nice. Not very dressy though. Oh yeah, that's nice. I want something matte, something flat. I'm nearly done here friends. I hope all you American watch enthusiasts don't feel hard done by this one as it wasn't really that American. Sadly I just don't get that many in for servicing in my neck of the woods. But have no fear I will find the right project to film for you guys and do it justice. Please let me know if my research on this subject was adequate or if you have anything to add so I can include it in my write up. Also, if there are any writers amongst you who have any interesting stories or pieces of history about any horological subject matter and you want it featured on the website, then email it to me and I'll add it to the site with your name on it. I suppose the takeaway from this episode is how big this little world is and how close we all really are. We have an American brand with a Japanese movement and a Chinese case, all put together from an office in Switzerland and then serviced by a dude in Birmingham with a strap made in Italy, using tools and equipment made in Germany, England and everywhere else. So my advice is get out there and explore, collaborate and embrace all these amazing cultures around you without fear. As fear often grows into hate and then that creates crazy people who do crazy things. It's your planet, our planet and it's the only one we got. And it wouldn't really be this earth without everyone in it. What the Donald Duck are you on about, you lunatic? Have you been in the sun again for too long? Just ignore him, he's not from this planet. So thank you all for watching. If you like your silent air SMR type restoration videos, then why not check out my second channel, Naked in Silence? No, seriously, why not? Even if you don't like them silent, you can still subscribe to it, you know, for my sake. If you loved me, you would. <laughs> what a creep. Take care of yourselves folks and please take care of one another. Peace, love and blessings to you all and if the Almighty wills, I'll see you on the next one. ta a bit.